The Dollhouse Murders, A Symphony of Terror. Sarah, a writer perpetually drowning in rejection letters and dwindling savings, stumbled upon a curious package nestled amongst the usual bills and flyers on her doorstep. It was heavy for its size, and a shiver ran down her spine as she cradled it in her arms. Inside, nestled in a bed of packing peanuts, lay a miniature replica of her own apartment. She gasped, staring at the tiny version of her messy living room, the chipped paint on the windowsill faithfully reproduced. Even the overflowing ashtray by the cluttered desk, a testament to her late-night writing sessions fueled by cheap coffee and despair, was recreated in miniature. But it was the figures inside the dollhouse that truly sent a jolt of terror through her. Tiny porcelain dolls, the perfect replicas of Sarah and her grumpy landlord, Mr. Henderson, stood frozen in the miniature apartment. Their faces, with unsettlingly lifelike details, the faint lines around Mr. Henderson's eyes, the worry etched on Sarah's brow, seemed to hold a hidden malevolence. Sarah couldn't shake the feeling that Mr. Henderson's beady black eyes, mere dots of paint, were following her every move. That night, sleep was a stranger. Images of the dollhouse flickered behind her eyelids, replacing the comforting darkness with a miniature world filled with an unsettling sense of foreboding. In a fever dream, she heard tiny screams, a sickening thud echoing from within the dollhouse. She woke with a gasp, cold sweat clinging to her skin. The next morning, news reports confirmed her worst fears. Mr. Henderson was found dead in his apartment, a pool of crimson blooming around his head. The scene, a grotesque caricature, mirrored the one Sarah had witnessed in her dream. Panic choked her, a cold hand squeezing her heart. She raced back to the dollhouse, heart pounding a frantic rhythm against her ribs. The scene inside had shifted. The doll dressed in Mr. Henderson's trademark robe lay crumpled on the miniature living room floor, a tiny smear of red marring the pristine white floorboards. Days bled into weeks, each sunrise bringing a new scene of horror to the dollhouse. A spilled cup of coffee in the miniature apartment mirrored a broken mug in her own kitchen. A chipped tooth on the Sarah doll followed a trip and fall on her part. The lines between reality and the dollhouse began to blur. She'd flinch at phantom sounds from within the miniature house, finding herself reaching for a cup of coffee that wasn't there. The once comforting routine of her life became a twisted game played out by unseen hands. The dolls, silent observers, became her constant companions. Her fear intensified with each passing day. The once familiar creak of the floorboards sounded like tiny screams, and the flickering streetlights outside cast grotesque shadows that seemed to mimic the movements of the dolls. Despair gnawed at Sarah's sanity. Her rejection pile grew taller, mirroring the growing sense of hopelessness that threatened to consume her. The dollhouse had become an obsession, a grotesque reflection of her own life slowly unraveling. She started keeping a journal, meticulously documenting every detail, the changes in the dollhouse, the strange coincidences in her own life. One afternoon, a frantic pounding at the door jolted her from her obsessive scribbling. It was Mrs. Ramirez, the elderly woman from downstairs, her face a mask of terror. Mrs. Ramirez, a constant source of gossip and unwanted conversation, now spoke in hushed tones about a dark presence in the building, a feeling of suffocating dread that had descended ever since the strange package arrived. Sarah dismissed Mrs. Ramirez's ramblings at first, but the seed of doubt had been planted. Was she imagining things? Was the dollhouse playing tricks on her mind? Or was something more sinister at play? The internet offered little solace. Obscure forums hinted at malevolent spirits trapped in objects, curses passed down through generations, and vengeful entities seeking retribution. None of it offered answers, only fueling the paranoia gnawing at Sarah's sanity. Desperate for answers, Sarah delved into the history of the building. Days were spent hunched over dusty microfilm at the library, piecing together a fragmented history of the tenement. She discovered the building had a dark past, rumored to be the site of a tragic fire that claimed several lives decades ago. The whispers spoke of a young doll maker who perished in the flames, his collection of intricately crafted dolls lost forever. A chilling realization struck Sarah. The dollhouse, an exact replica of her apartment, 
was too perfect to be a random coincidence. Could it hold the key to the haunting? Could the dolls be somehow connected to the fire, to the doll maker? Driven by a morbid curiosity and a desperate hope of breaking the curse, Sarah ventured into the dusty basement, the air thick with the smell of mildew and forgotten things. Armed with a flashlight and a growing sense of dread, she navigated the labyrinthine corridors, the flickering beam revealing cobwebs clinging to exposed pipes and peeling paint revealing cryptic messages scrawled on the walls. A faint scratching sound, like tiny claws on concrete, sent shivers down her spine. The flashlight beam landed on a boarded-up doorway at the far end of the corridor. It was the only unexplored section, a dark, festering wound in the building's underbelly. Her heart hammered against her ribs, but Sarah knew she had to see what lay beyond. With trembling hands, she pried loose the rotting boards, revealing a hidden chamber, a wave of stale air, thick with the smell of burnt wood and something more sinister, washed over her. Inside, the room was illuminated by a single flickering bulb. Dust motes danced in the pale light, revealing a scene as if frozen in time. A workbench overflowing with half-finished dolls lay in the center, each one with unsettlingly lifelike features. A chair lay overturned beside it, and on the wall hung an assortment of delicately crafted dolls, their painted faces seeming to hold a silent scream. But what truly sent a jolt of terror through Sarah was the charred skeleton slumped in the corner, clutching a single, eerily familiar doll, a miniature version of the dollhouse itself. As Sarah stumbled back, the floorboard beneath her creaked, echoing through the chamber. A gust of wind, seemingly from nowhere, extinguished the bulb, plunging her into darkness. Panic seized her as she fumbled for the flashlight, the scratching sound growing louder, closer. Suddenly, a cold hand clamped over her mouth, a chilling whisper rasped in her ear. Don't leave yet, the story's just getting started. The beam of her flashlight cut through the darkness, revealing the source of the voice, a doll, a grotesque replica of the doll maker himself, his painted eyes burning with an unnatural malice. The miniature Sarah doll in the dollhouse mirrored the scene, a tiny hand clamped over its porcelain mouth. Sarah screamed, a primal cry of terror that echoed through the basement. In the chaos, she dropped the flashlight the darkness engulfing her once more. She scrambled back, desperate to escape, but unseen hands grabbed her ankles, pulling her down. The world dissolved into a cacophony of sounds, her own ragged breaths, the chilling laughter of the dolls, the scratching that seemed to come from everywhere at once. Then, a sickening crunch, followed by a horrifying silence. Sarah awoke with a gasp, cold sweat clinging to her skin. She was back in her apartment, the morning sunlight filtering through the dusty window. Relief washed over her, so intense it bordered on euphoria. But as her eyes fell on the dollhouse, a wave of dread settled in her stomach. The scene inside had changed. The miniature Sarah doll lay on the floor of the dollhouse, its porcelain face cracked, a dark stain spreading across its chest. The dollmaker doll was gone replaced by a scene that sent a fresh wave of terror through her. The miniature Sarah stood poised with a tiny knife, a replica of the one Sarah kept under her pillow. The knife was pointed at the miniature Mr. Ramirez, the elderly woman from downstairs, his tiny porcelain face contorted in a silent scream. Sarah knew then that the nightmare wasn't over. It had simply taken a new form. She was trapped in a twisted game, forced to watch as the dolls enacted their macabre plans. The only way to break the curse, she realized with chilling certainty, was to play by their rules. Days turned into weeks, each morning revealing a new scene of impending doom in the dollhouse. Sarah, driven to desperation, sought help from anyone who would listen, eccentric antique dealers, occult figures lurking in the fringes of society, anyone who might offer a glimmer of hope. But the answers remained elusive. Each encounter only confirmed the chilling truth. She was the target. The dollhouse a macabre puppet show leading to her inevitable demise. Yet, amidst the despair, a flicker of defiance sparked within her. She wouldn't be a pawn in their twisted game. One night, fueled by a potent concoction brewed by a shadowy figure she found on the dark web, 
Sarah stood before the dollhouse. The miniature Sarah doll mirrored her stance, a determined glint in its painted eyes. I won't be your puppet, Sarah declared, her voice hoarse with determination. This ends now. As she spoke, an ancient incantation rose to her lips. The words gleamed from dusty tomes and whispered secrets. The room grew cold, the shadows dancing on the walls as the power of the ritual crackled in the air. The dolls within the house writhed, their painted faces contorting in silent screams. The miniature Sarah doll in the dollhouse raised its tiny hand, mimicking Sarah's movements, and the two figures chanted in unison, their voices echoing eerily in the small space. Suddenly, a gust of wind swept through the room, extinguishing the lights and plunging them into darkness. A cold, spectral hand clamped over Sarah's shoulder, its touch sending shivers down her spine. A raspy voice, ancient and filled with malice, whispered in her ear, You cannot defy fate, child. The game is afoot, and you are but a player. Fear threatened to consume her, but Sarah pushed forward, fueled by a desperate hope. I choose my own fate, she gritted out, channeling every ounce of her will. As she spoke, a blinding light erupted from the dollhouse, momentarily banishing the darkness. Sarah shielded her eyes, then peeked through her fingers to witness a sight that stole her breath away. Inside the dollhouse, the miniature figures were locked in a struggle. The dollmaker doll, his face twisted in rage, grappled with a spectral figure that resembled a young boy, his form shimmering like smoke. It was the spirit of the deceased dollmaker, trapped and bound to the dolls he had created. The spectral boy reached for the miniature Sarah doll, his touch causing it to glow with an ethereal light. Then, with a final, heart-wrenching cry, the boy and the doll merged. The blinding light subsided, leaving behind an unsettling quiet. The dollhouse remained open, the miniature Sarah doll now a perfect replica of the spectral boy, its eyes filled with a newfound peace. Sarah cautiously reached out a finger, touching the miniature boy's porcelain face. A warmth bloomed where her finger met the cold porcelain, and a sense of calm washed over her. The spectral touch on her shoulder was gone. The next morning, news broke that a young boy's remains had been discovered during construction work near the building. The boy, it seemed, had been a talented doll maker who perished in a fire decades ago. The story resonated with Sarah, a chilling confirmation of the truth she had unearthed. The dollhouse remained, a constant reminder of the ordeal, but the scenes within no longer depicted impending doom. Instead, they showed the boy, his miniature form now infused with a gentle warmth, playing with the other dolls, a smile gracing his porcelain face. The curse was broken, but Sarah was forever changed. The experience had left its mark, a chilling reminder of the darkness that lurks beneath the surface. Yet, within the darkness, she had discovered a flicker of light, the courage to face her fears and the resilience of the human spirit. As she continued writing, her stories no longer reflected the despair of rejection letters. They now held a newfound depth, a touch of the unsettling that resonated with a raw, primal fear. The world may not have been ready for her genius before, but her brush with the darkness had forged her into a storyteller unlike any other. The dollhouse, a symbol of horror, had become her muse, a reminder that the greatest stories often reside in the shadows, waiting to be unearthed. <coughs> the boy with porcelain eyes, Emily and David, a young couple yearning for a child, stumbled upon Ethan in a quiet orphanage nestled amidst rolling hills. He was a wisp of a boy, barely eight, with a mop of unruly brown hair and the most unsettling feature, eyes that seemed carved from polished porcelain. They were devoid of the usual warmth and depth of human eyes, replaced by an icy, vacant blue that sent shivers down Emily's spine. David, a pragmatic lawyer, dismissed her unease as nerves. He's just an orphan, Em, maybe a little lost, he said, his hand finding hers in a gesture of comfort. But Emily couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about Ethan. Despite her initial apprehension, Emily found herself drawn to Ethan's quiet demeanor. When he smiled, a rare and fleeting occurrence, his whole face transformed, 
showcasing a vulnerability that melted her reservations. They adopted him that very day, eager to shower him with the love and care he so desperately needed. Their joy, however, was short-lived. Strange things began to happen soon after Ethan moved in. At first, they were subtle, misplaced objects, doors creaking open on their own, an unsettling feeling of being watched. Then the dolls arrived. Ethan seemed fixated on them. A dusty porcelain doll from a thrift store became his constant companion. He carried it everywhere, whispering secrets to its painted face and arranging its stiff limbs in elaborate poses. More dolls followed, each one more disturbing than the last. Some were missing limbs, their chipped porcelain revealing hollow insides. Others had vacant, button eyes that seemed to follow you around the room. As the collection grew, Ethan's behavior changed. He became withdrawn, speaking less and spending hours locked in his room, arranging the dolls in intricate tableaus. The dolls began to resemble the family, a miniature Emily, David, and even a smaller doll with unsettlingly familiar porcelain eyes. One night, Emily woke to a blood-curdling scream. Rushing to Ethan's room, she found him in a frenzy, surrounded by the dolls. The miniature Emily doll lay on the floor, its porcelain head shattered, a smear of red paint across its tiny chest. A wave of nausea washed over her as she noticed the glint of a sharp object in Ethan's hand, a shard of porcelain, perfectly mirroring the one embedded in the doll's chest. Ethan stared at her, his porcelain eyes reflecting a terrifying calmness. I had to punish her, he said in a monotone voice, devoid of any emotion. She was mean to me, panic clawed at Emily's throat. This wasn't T normal childhood behavior. Fear turned to a cold dread as she realized the dolls weren't just playthings. They were somehow connected to Ethan, reflecting his emotions, perhaps even amplifying them. David, initially skeptical of Emily's concerns, grew increasingly worried as the incidents became more frequent. Furniture would move on its own, and whispers, seemingly emanating from the dolls, filled the house at night. Then, one evening, David found a message scrawled in jagged letters on their bedroom mirror. They will take you. Driven by desperation, Emily and David delved into Ethan's past. The orphanage offered little information, only confirming his arrival after a fire that claimed his entire family. A local legend whispered of a doll maker who practiced dark magic, crafting dolls imbued with the spirits of the dead. The fire, they said, consumed his workshop and everything inside. A horrifying possibility dawned on them. What if Ethan wasn't just an orphan? What if he was somehow connected to the deceased doll maker? his spirit residing in one of the dolls influencing Ethan's actions. Desperate for help, they consulted a local historian, a wizened old woman named Ms. Hawthorne. She listened intently to their story, her face grim. The dolls, she rasped, her voice raspy with age. They are vessels, not for spirits, but for the darkness within. Ms. Hawthorne spoke of a ritual, a way to sever the connection between Ethan and the dolls. But the ritual required a sacrifice, an object of utmost importance, imbued with love and belonging. It was a gamble and the stakes couldn't be higher. Emily knew what she had to do. On a moonless night, with David holding Ethan back, she stood before the collection of dolls. Clutching a worn teddy bear, a gift from her late mother, she began the ritual. The air crackled with unseen energy as Miss Hawthorne chanted in an ancient language. The dolls writhed, their painted faces contorting in a silent scream. A deafening crash resonated through the house. Ethan screamed, a chilling sound that tore at Emily's heart. When she opened her eyes, the room was bathed in an eerie blue light. The dolls were still, their vacant eyes locked on Emily. In Ethan's hand, the porcelain shard that mirrored the doll's wound had vanished. He looked at her a flicker of emotion crossing his porcelain eyes, a chilling mixture of fear and rage. You broke them, he whispered, his voice laced with a venom that sent shivers down Emily's spine. The air grew thick, a suffocating pressure pressing down on them. Then, a voice, cold and disembodied, echoed in the room. Foolish mortals, you cannot sever the ties that bind. 
The voice seemed to emanate from all the dolls at once, a chorus of whispers that chilled them to the bone. It was then that Emily noticed a change in Ethan. His eyes, once a vacant blue, flickered with a malevolent intelligence. A cruel smile stretched across his lips, revealing sharp, pointed teeth that hadn't been there before. This wasn't the boy they had adopted, not anymore. This was something else, a dark entity using Ethan as a vessel. David lunged forward, grabbing Ethan's arm. But Ethan's strength was inhuman. He flung David across the room with a sickening thud. Terror clawed at Emily's throat. This was no longer a fight against dolls. It was a battle against an ancient evil unleashed. Desperately, she cast a glance at Miss Hawthorne who stood trembling in the corner. The old woman met her gaze, a flicker of determination replacing the fear. With a shaky hand, she pointed a gnarled finger at a shelf across the room. On it, nestled amongst dusty books, lay a small, intricately carved wooden box. The binding box, Miss Hawthorne croaked, her voice barely a whisper. It holds the key to trapping the entity. Emily understood. The ritual might have failed to sever the connection, but it had weakened the bond. Now they had a chance to contain it, but reaching the box was a daunting task. Ethan, now fully possessed by the entity, stalked towards her with inhuman speed. His eyes, glowing with a malevolent blue light, burned into hers. Thinking fast, Emily snatched the teddy bear, her mother's love a tangible warmth in her hand. This belonged to my mother, she shouted, her voice shaking. It holds more love than anything you can possess. Ethan paused, his head tilting in curiosity. The entity, seemingly intrigued by the object, struggled for control. This was her chance. With a desperate lunge, Emily dashed towards the shelf, dodging shards of porcelain the possessed Ethan flung at her. She snatched the box, feeling a surge of energy flow through it as she held it tight. As she turned, the possessed Ethan was upon her. His porcelain face contorted into a grotesque mask of rage. But before he could reach her, Ms. Hawthorne, with a sudden burst of strength, tripped him with her cane. The entity shrieked in fury, a sound that shook the very foundation of the house. With a desperate cry, Emily slammed the box shut, the carvings on its surface glowing with an ethereal light. A wave of energy pulsed through the room, throwing them all back. The dolls exploded in a shower of porcelain shards. The blue light dissipated, leaving behind a thick, oppressive darkness. When Emily dared to open her eyes, the room was silent. Ethan lay unconscious on the floor, his face pale and devoid of the malevolent intelligence it had held moments before. David, shaken but alive, crawled to her side. Ms. Hawthorne, drained but triumphant, lay gasping for breath. The ordeal was over, but at a terrible cost. The dolls were destroyed, a chilling reminder of the darkness they had contained. They waited, a heavy silence hanging in the air, unsure if the entity had been truly contained or simply biding its time. Days turned into weeks, then months. Ethan remained in a coma, his porcelain eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. The doctors were baffled, offering no explanation for his condition. Emily and David kept a constant vigil, their love for the boy they had adopted battling the fear of the entity that might still reside within him. One day, while reading a book to Ethan, Emily noticed a single tear roll down his cheek. It was a small miracle, a sign of life they hadn't dared to hope for. Soon, Ethan woke, a child again, confused and scared. He had no memory of the events that had unfolded or the entity that had possessed him. Relief washed over Emily and David, but the scars of their ordeal remained. They kept the box containing the entity hidden away, a constant reminder of the darkness they had faced. Ethan, too, carried a shadow within him, a haunted look in his eyes that mirrored the unsettling blue of the porcelain dolls. Years passed. Ethan grew into a young man, haunted by fragmented memories and nightmares of screaming dolls and a cold, blue light. He never fully recovered his early childhood innocence. Despite the therapy and love he received, a sliver of unease always lingered. He excelled in art, his drawings often depicting disturbingly realistic dolls with vacant eyes. 
Then, one day, while visiting the local museum with his art class, Ethan stumbled upon an exhibit on ancient artifacts. His gaze fell upon a collection of intricately carved wooden boxes, remarkably similar to the one his parents kept hidden away. A chill ran down his spine as he felt an unexplainable pull towards one particular box. As he leaned closer, the memory, long suppressed, flooded back the ritual, the dolls, the chilling voice. Panic seized him, and he stumbled back, the weight of the repressed trauma threatening to crush him. He confided in Emily, hesitant and scared, revealing the fragmented memories and the strange connection he felt to the box at the museum. Emily, her face pale, decided it was time to tell Ethan the truth. She revealed the horrifying events of his childhood, the entity that had possessed him, and the box that contained it. Tears streamed down Ethan's face as he processed the story, a mixture of disbelief and horror washing over him. They decided to consult Ms. Hawthorne, now a frail woman nearing the end of her life. When she saw Ethan, a flicker of recognition crossed her face. The entity, she rasped, her voice barely a whisper. It feeds on darkness, on fear. The boy, he will be its target. These words filled Emily and David with dread. They knew they couldn't avoid the box at the museum forever. It was a ticking time bomb, a beacon for the entity trapped within their own box. A plan had to be formed, a way to permanently destroy the entity before it could possess Ethan again. Ms. Hawthorne revealed the final part of the ritual, a dangerous act that required Ethan to confront the entity within the museum box. He would need to be strong to channel his own light to overpower the entity's darkness. It was a risky gamble, but it was their only hope. The night of the confrontation arrived, cloaked in an oppressive silence. Emily and David waited outside the museum, their hearts pounding against their ribs. Inside, Ethan stood before the box, his face etched with a mixture of fear and determination. With trembling hands, he lifted the lid. A wave of icy coldness washed over him. The box contained nothing but a swirling vortex of black mist, pulsating with malevolent energy. From within, a chilling voice echoed, a chorus of the whispers he remembered from his childhood. You cannot escape me, boy. You are mine. Ethan closed his eyes, focusing on the love of his parents, the warmth that had anchored him through the years. He remembered Miss Hawthorne's words, light conquers darkness. With a deep breath, he summoned his courage and unleashed a wave of pure, white light from within himself. The entity shrieked, its form writhing in agony as the light engulfed it. The museum echoed with the sound of its struggle, artifacts trembling on their shelves. Slowly, the entity weakened, shrinking into a tiny, pulsating ball of darkness. With a final burst of light, Ethan banished the entity. Silence descended, heavy and thick. He collapsed, drained but victorious. Dawn broke, painting the sky with streaks of pink and orange. Outside the museum, Emily and David rushed to his side, relief washing over them as they saw him alive and well. The ordeal had taken its toll. Ethan was left physically and emotionally drained, but the entity was gone. They sealed the museum box, a silent testament to the darkness they had faced. Though the threat was neutralized, a sense of vigilance remained. They knew the darkness, like a shadow, was always lurking, waiting for an opportunity to return. Ethan continued his art, his drawings now depicting not monsters, but beautiful landscapes bathed in warm sunlight. He never forgot the darkness he had faced, but he learned to channel his fear into a powerful force for good. He vowed to use his art to remind people of the power of love and light in the face of darkness. The story of the boy with porcelain eyes became a legend whispered amongst artists, a cautionary tale of the darkness that can lurk within beautiful things. It served as a reminder that courage, love, and a flicker of light can overcome even the most terrifying shadows. The dollhouse, where childhood nightmares come alive. The attic air hung heavy with the musty scent of forgotten things. Dust motes danced in the single shaft of sunlight that speared through the grime-coated window. I shuffled through cobwebs and displaced a colony of startled spiders as I made my way towards a shrouded shape in the corner. 
It was an imposing dollhouse, a miniature Victorian mansion crafted with an almost obsessive level of detail. My grandmother, a woman whose stories were always tinged with a touch of the macabre, had bequeathed it to me in her will. As a child, I'd spent countless hours lost in its miniature world, weaving fantastical tales for the porcelain inhabitants. But time, like dust, has a way of settling on memories, blurring the lines between reality and imagination. Now, years later, I approached the dollhouse with a hesitant curiosity. The ornately carved would seem to pulse with an unseen energy, and the tiny windows, once portals to a world of make-believe, now felt like watchful eyes. An inexplicable urge to flee battled with a morbid fascination, and I found myself reaching out to pull back the dusty sheet. The interior was immaculate, every miniature rug perfectly aligned, every piece of furniture meticulously placed. But there was a dissonance, a subtle wrongness that sent shivers down my spine. The wallpaper, a floral pattern in my childhood memories, now depicted skeletal figures reaching out from behind the roses. The once cheerful faces of the dolls were contorted into expressions of silent screams. A rocking chair, vacant in my recollection, now creaked rhythmically back and forth, its miniature occupant a skeletal doll with glowing red eyes that seemed to lock onto mine. A primal scream ripped from my throat, and I stumbled back, knocking over a porcelain teacup. The sound echoed through the attic, shattering the silence and sending a jolt of movement through the house. The dolls began to move, not with the jerky, pre-programmed motions of a child's toy, but with a horrifying fluidity. Tiny limbs twitched, porcelain faces contorted further into grotesque expressions of malice. A choked sob escaped my lips as the miniature figures descended from the dollhouse, their painted eyes burning with an unnatural light. The rocking chair continued its relentless creaking, a chilling counterpoint to the symphony of clicks and clacks of the advancing dolls. Panic seized me, and I bolted towards the attic window, the only escape route I could see. My hand grasped the rusty latch, but it wouldn't budge. A wave of despair washed over me as I realized I was trapped. The lead doll, a skeletal replica of my grandmother, reached me first. Its bony finger, tipped with a porcelain claw, dug into my arm. A searing pain shot through me, but it was the cold, emotionless stare of its glowing eyes that truly terrified me. In a voice that rasped like sandpaper on bone, it spoke. Welcome back, child, it rasped. We've been waiting for you. The other dolls closed in, their tiny hands reaching for me. I squeezed my eyes shut, bracing for the inevitable. But instead of pain, I felt a tug, a sensation of falling. When I opened my eyes, I was no longer in the attic. I found myself in a miniature replica of my childhood bedroom. Everything scaled down to the size of the dollhouse. The wallpaper with the skeletal figures was the same. The rocking chair creaked ominously in the corner. And there, on the miniature bed, lay a porcelain doll that looked exactly like me, its eyes vacant and lifeless. Terror choked me. I was trapped, miniaturized and imprisoned within the very dollhouse that had once been my haven. The skeletal doll that resembled my grandmother stood over me, a cruel smile painted on its porcelain face. Now, it rasped, its voice echoing in the confined space. You get to play with us forever. The years that followed were an eternity of torment. I witnessed the dolls enact scenes from a twisted childhood nightmare, their expressions a chilling mockery of innocence. The rocking chair creaked a constant lullaby of despair, and the glowing eyes of the dolls seemed to bore into my soul. I wasn't alone. 
Through whispers carried on the dusty air, I learned of others who had fallen prey to the dollhouse. Lost souls like me, trapped in this miniature world of unending horror. One day, a new arrival joined us, a little girl, no older than five, her eyes wide with terror. A surge of protectiveness, long dormant, stirred within me. I couldn't let her suffer the same fate. Years of observing the dolls had revealed a pattern to their movements, a dark choreography to their madness. I began to formulate a plan, a desperate gamble for our freedom. The little girl, whose name I learned was Lily, clung to me, her tiny porcelain body trembling. I explained my plan in hushed tones, my voice hoarse from disuse. It was a risky proposition, relying on manipulating the doll's movements to create an opening. The plan hinged on the rocking chair. I'd noticed that whenever a specific doll passed in front of its path, it would momentarily cease its creaking. This brief pause, I hoped, would be our window. The next full moon, the night when the doll's movement seemed most erratic, was our chosen escape attempt. As the spectral light bathed the miniature room in an eerie glow, I positioned Lily behind a miniature dresser, hoping to shield her from the initial confrontation. The symphony of clicks and clacks began, the dolls moving in their preordained patterns. My heart hammered against my ribs as the skeletal doll that resembled my grandmother approached the rocking chair. This was it. Taking a deep breath, I lunged forward, grabbing a miniature candlestick from the dollhouse table. With a desperate cry, I slammed it down on the rocking chair, shattering its miniature form. The effect was immediate. The room plunged into a deathly silence, the dolls frozen mid-step, their glowing eyes flickering erratically. A wave of terror washed over me, but it was quickly replaced by a surge of hope. The silence stretched for an agonizing moment, then the skeletal doll that resembled my grandmother spoke. Its voice, however, was different, laced with a flicker of surprise. What have you done? It rasped. Enough! I spat back, my voice hoarse but resolute. This ends now. The other dolls began to twitch, their movements regaining their fluidity. But before they could advance, the air shimmered, and a spectral figure materialized in the center of the room. It was a woman, her form cloaked in an ethereal glow, her face obscured by shadows. Recognition flared within me, it was my grandmother, not the skeletal mockery that had tormented me. Finally, she whispered, her voice filled with a deep sadness. You are strong enough. The spectral figure turned towards the dolls, her form solidifying. With a wave of her hand, she ripped them from their miniature bodies, sending the porcelain shells crashing to the floor. The tiny, lifeless bodies they had inhabited followed suit, their glowing eyes extinguished. Relief washed over me, so intense it almost felt like pain. Lily emerged from behind the dresser, her eyes wide with wonder. My grandmother knelt before her, her spectral form radiating warmth. You are free now, she said, her voice soft. Go back to the world you belong to. With a gentle touch, my grandmother placed Lily on the miniature windowsill. The window, opaque a moment before, shimmered, revealing a familiar scene. Lily's bedroom, bathed in the soft glow of the morning sun. Tears welled up in my eyes as Lily turned to me, a small smile playing on her lips. Thank you, she whispered before stepping through the window. The window solidified shut, leaving me alone with my grandmother. Why? I croaked, my voice thick with emotion. Why did you trap us here? My grandmother's spectral form shimmered, and for the first time, I saw the pain etched on her face. This house, she began, her voice trembling, 
It held a darkness, a malevolent force that fed on fear. It took hold of me when I was just a child, twisting my love for dolls into something monstrous. She explained how she had lured others into the dollhouse, their fear sustaining the entity that resided within. But a part of her, a sliver of her true self, had always resisted. She had hoped, against all hope, that one day someone would be strong enough to break free. You are my descendant, she continued, and you possess the same strength that I lacked. You not only freed yourself, but also the others trapped within. A wave of sadness washed over me. The woman before me, a victim as much as a perpetrator, had finally found peace. But the knowledge couldn't erase the years of torment. What happens now? I asked. My grandmother smiled, a sad, wistful expression. The entity is no more, she said. The darkness has lifted. This place can finally rest. The room began to shimmer, the spectral light intensifying. My grandmother reached out, her touch cool and comforting. Thank you, she whispered, her form dissolving into shimmering particles of light. The light engulfed me, and then there was darkness. When I awoke, I was lying on the attic floor, the dusty air thick with the scent of cobwebs and decay. Sunlight streamed through the grime-coated window, casting long shadows across the room. My body ached, every muscle screaming in protest from the ordeal. But the most overwhelming sensation was a profound emptiness, a hollowness where the terror and despair had once resided. The dollhouse stood in the corner, shrouded in dust once more. But this time, it held no allure, no sense of wonder. It was simply an ornate box, a relic of a dark past. I rose to my feet, my legs shaky but determined. As I made my way towards the attic stairs, I glanced back at the dollhouse. A single thought echoed in my mind. It was finally over, 